Hey folks, coming to you with another uh, Wednesday worship service, and as we've been doing these last few weeks, this one is drawn from um, a particular historical worship book for our, from our Presbyterian tradition. As you can see, I'm here in, uh, not in my office at church, but in what's sort of become my home office uh, during this coronavirus time, uh, when needed, uh, the back porch of my house. We've got a screened-in back porch, and uh, sometimes, even with the birds chirping, it's the quietest place. Uh, and in the house with uh, the kids home and Ryan working from home. So um, anyway, I thought I'd, I'd come to you here, uh, from here, I should say, for our Wednesday service. Um, if I was at the office, I'd have even more books to show you, but I want to show you some books that are here and, and from which our, our service is drawn and tell you a little bit of the history of this. So a few weeks ago, we had a service, uh, uh, one of our Wednesday services that was drawn from uh, liturgies that a guy named Charles Baird pulled together in the 1850s. Uh, he did that sort of on his own, uh, but in, informed by the history of the Reformed tradition. So then over time, uh, there began to be this liturgical renewal movement among many Protestants, and, and in particular in the Presbyterian Church. One of the lead figures of that was a guy named Henry Van Dyke. Henry Van Dyke is a fascinating uh, uh, person. He was... He was uh, uh, a Presbyterian minister and, and uh, uh, educator. He, he taught at Princeton. Uh, he was a, a classmate, a Princeton classmate of Woodrow Wilson, who actually appointed him to serve as, as an ambassador to Holland, uh, and he was there during World War I. Uh, Henry Van Dyke was a good friend of Helen Keller's, uh, he actually officiated at Mark Twain's funeral. I mean, just think of all the fascinating intersection of, of history there. Uh, so anyway, but one other thing, uh, he's also the, the person who wrote the text to the, the hymn that we know and love, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love, hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Henry Van Dyke is the one who, who, who wrote those words to that, uh, that wonderful uh, uh, Beethoven tune. So, one of the other pieces, though, Henry Van Dyke was a leading figure in this liturgical renewal movement, that is, for Presbyterians who had resisted too much uh, uh, worship or prayer being written down uh, because it, it went back to some old worries that they had all the way back to the Reformation era about things not being authentic in the moment. But Henry Van Dyke was able to balance that form and freedom together really well. So in uh, 1906... Uh, he chaired a committee uh, of the Presbyterian Church, and he really did most of the, the grunt work for this, uh, to put together the Book of Common Worship. It was the first official approved uh, worship document for the Presbyterian Church. Now, that was the northern uh, stream of the Presbyterian Church, because that was during the, the period where the north and south were separated from one another. Uh, then he chaired another round of revision. They did a second Book of Common Worship that came out in the 1930s. Uh, after he died, they did another one in the 1940s. And then uh, in uh, 1970, they put, uh, the, 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 a book was published uh, very plainly just called The Worship Book. Uh, and this, this book uh, was produced by actually three denominations, I believe, maybe, maybe even, oh, even more than that. So The Worship Book was uh, 1979, and this was the Northern Presbyterian Church. 1970, I think I said, the Southern Presbyterian Church, the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, I guess it was those three, yeah, those three denominations, so 1970, so uh, the North and South had not yet reunited, that happened in 1982, but they were already beginning to work together towards reunion. Uh, PCUSA came into existence as the Northern and Southern branches of the, of the church uh, reunited, reformed in 1983. And soon thereafter, they put together a group that was charged with, with putting together a new revised Book of Common Worship to reflect its reunited church. And so in 1993, it took them 10 years to put together the Book of Common Worship. This, um, when I was uh, growing up and, and, and becoming a minister, uh, this, was, was, this was the book. This was the book. I, I fell in love with uh, liturgy and crafting worship through just pouring over these pages. And then, uh, a few years ago... Uh, the PCUSA said, well, it's, it's about time. Every 20 years or so, uh, we tend to, to put out a new updated version. And so uh, the new Book of Common Worship came out in 2018. Uh, and and um, I got to serve on the editorial review board for this. So this was a great 
uh, group. So anyway, that's a little bit of history of where we came uh, from, the, these officially endorsed uh, books. And if you're not Presbyterian or if you don't remember this maybe from some other conversations we've had, um, the way Presbyterian worship works is we produce these resources uh, so that we aren't just flying by the seat of our pants, but unlike some of our other uh, Christian brothers and sisters, we are not uh, restricted to only being able to use just these resources for worship. So these are more guides than they are uh, uh, restrictions. This is, this is uh, suggestions of how to worship. Okay, so with all of that said, I, I tell you that because the, where our service comes from today is this interim piece. So 1970 was this thin, brief version that the, all three denominations worked on together. And 1993 was the Book of Common Worship that came out. Between these two, uh, the committee that was in charge of putting this book together, it came out in the early 90s, began in the 80s uh, sending out drafts to get feedback from, or they called them uh, supplemental liturgies. And so there's a whole collection. This is the one for daily prayer, but there's one on baptism, marriage, Sunday worship, uh, pastoral care, all, all these different topics that show up in there. Uh, and they put out these in 19, I think it was 87, right? Yeah, 1987. Uh, they sent these out to uh, pastors and others who wanted to study them to say, all right, use this for a while. Give us feedback so that as we work on the finished product, we know uh, how things are coming together. So I'm going to draw our daily prayer service, this midday service of prayer from uh, some of the liturgy here, particularly the daily prayer liturgy that was suggested for, uh, for use on Wednesdays. Um, all right, let me see. That's good. So that's a long introduction, but now you know way more about the history of Presbyterian worship in the 20, 20th century and early 21st century. All right, so uh, midday prayer service. Let us begin with a call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Lord is our God who command, whose commands are for all the world. Never forget God's covenant, which is made to last forever. On Wednesdays, we're invited, this uh, suggests for us, to read Psalm 121. So let's uh, hear these words from the ancient psalm. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where is, from where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot be moved, nor will the one who watches over you fall asleep. Behold, the keeper of Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve you from all evil and will keep your life. The Lord will watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, then we're invited to pray a prayer based on the psalm. Keep watch, O God, over our lives this day. Guide us that we may not stumble into sin. Protect us that we may not be overcome by evil. Sustain us that we may do what is good, right, and loving in Jesus Christ. Amen. Then a, a scripture lesson for the day. Let me find this. Sorry, I thought I had all of this pulled up. Scripture lesson for today from Romans chapter 6. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
We move on to prayers drawn from our, our worship today. Let us pray. Eternal God, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to direct and rule us according to your will, to comfort us in all our afflictions, to defend us from all error, and to lead us into all truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal God, you call us to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessed Savior, at this hour of noon, you hung upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms. Grant that all the people of the earth may look to you and be saved for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. God of mercy, bless the work we have begun this day. Make good its defects and let us finish it in a way that pleases you. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. We are then invited to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before closing, uh, we're invited to join in a hymn, either reading, singing or reading a hymn. And we could certainly open the pages to the hymnal. But uh, this book presents uh, some interesting, uh, interesting gifts for uh, uh, hymns and songs. So, so it includes in it what it refers to as biblical songs and ancient hymns. So these are either some songs that are in the Bible themselves, like the song of Simeon or the song of Zechariah or the song of Hannah. We've, we've used some of those before in our worship. But it also has some early uh, first century church hymns that were used in, in worship. And it has some, some hymns or some, some sort of poetic collections that are drawn from pulling in different parts of various scripture readings. So, uh, for instance, here is uh, the Song of Miriam and Moses. This is uh, uh, drawn from Exodus chapter 15. This is uh, part of the song that Miriam sings and the song that Moses sings after the Hebrews are freed from slavery through the waters of the Red Sea. I will sing to the Lord so lofty and uplifted. The horse and its rider have been hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my refuge. The Lord has become my Savior. This is my God whom I will praise, the God of my people whom I will exalt. The Lord is a mighty warrior whose name is Yahweh. The chariots of Pharaoh and his army have been hurled into the sea. The finest of those who bear armor have been drowned in the Red Sea. The fathomless deep has overwhelmed them. They sank into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O God, is glorious in might. Your right hand, O Lord, has overthrown the enemy. Who can be compared with you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, awesome in renown, and worker of wonders? Another one that they have uh, drawn together in here, uh, they refer to as uh, the Song of New Jerusalem. This is based on uh, various uh, parts of Isaiah chapter 60, describing Jerusalem and uh, uh, its witness to the world. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom enshrouds the peoples. But over you the Lord will rise, and the splendor of God will appear upon you. Nations will stream to your light, and rulers to the brightness of your dawning. Your gates will always be open. By day or night they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion 
of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will be will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. You will name your walls salvation, and all your portals praise. Just some, some great um, hymns in here. Uh, f- uh, one more, this is, uh, they, they title it, A Song of Love. And this is drawn from uh, 1 John chapter 4 and from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. All who love are born of God and know God. All who not, do not love do not know God. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not quick to take offense. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love bears all things and believes all things. Love hopes and endures all things. Love will never come to an end. There are three things that last forever. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So uh, let us close with our dismissal drawn from Philippians chapter 4. The God of peace be with us. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. So uh, starting with that history lesson at the beginning, maybe that was uh, uh, not that interesting and boring for you, but, but one of the things that I think is important is to see, uh, to one, this balance between order and freedom, uh, or as some would say, between form and freedom that's part of our Presbyterian tradition, right? To, to, to be grounded in a past and connected to those who uh, have gone before us through sharing their words, but also to not be so bound that we're unable to express anew what God is doing now and today. Uh, that's, that's the powerful, overarching theme of the history of Presbyterian worship. But the other, uh, that, that this resource and the others that accompany it, these su- supplemental liturgy resources, uh, remind me of is that we are, as, as uh, the Presbyterians have long said, the church reformed and always being reformed by the Holy Spirit according to the Word of God. And so what that means, if we are always in a process of being reformed and being changed, I think that means also that it's okay to experiment, Right? It's okay to, to, to try some things out. That's what this whole series was about. They said, we're in this interim time between one book and another, and in the meantime, we want to get ideas out and gather feedback back. We're, we're not just a group of people writing uh, liturgies in an ivory tower disconnected from the world. And so these provisional statements or, or temporary attempts to uh, gather together prayers that are helpful, but also to invite feedback from them. I think that's an important part of our process as well, that is an important uh, metaphor for the way that we are church in the world at all times, but especially in this time right now, right? When our uh, world is separated physically from one another because of the coronavirus, when we feel uh, a sense of separation as division is lifted up, uh, as as, uh, voices that seek to divide, uh, as we see racial injustice and division of people based on the color of their skin and outcries for for peace and and righteousness and and, uh, God's justice, biblical justice. Uh, It's a reminder for us that in times in between, times where things aren't settled, uh, that it's okay to try, to experiment, to know that we may fail, but failing is better than not trying at all. And so um, I hope that that from this devotion today, this this, uh, midday liturgy, You've uh, been inspired to uh, attempt things that aren't permanent and uh, to know that you're a work in progress and that that progress is being guided by the work of God through the Holy Spirit in the Word of God as it's shared in the church. All right, thanks and uh, see you soon.